Welcome, everyone. This is Illiterate. My name is Evan. My name is Taylor. I read a magazine this week. I watched a movie. This week, we are covering Bad Education. This is the story of the real Rosalind County, New York uh, school district, where the beloved superintendent starts to find out that money is missing. They think they find the culprit, and lo and behold, money still is missing. <laughs> this is the tale of the largest uh, school embezzlement scandal in American history. I've watched the film, and I have to say my jaw was on the floor about the entire time. It's probably the most surprising film I have seen this year. They're calling this Hugh Jackman's best role, which I thought was pretty uh, incredible, actually, because, I mean, you would think, well, Wolverine is like, you know, his role of a lifetime. They're saying this is his best role, and I have to agree. I would say uh, we don't know how the rules are going to be adjusted for Oscars, Emmys, with streaming. This is a feature, so I don't know. Uh, what I can say is I am fairly confident that Hugh Jackman is going to be nominated for Best Actor in either or. And um, as you'll see, it's a very nuanced portrait. He's not a good guy. Or a bad guy. He's this, both. Yeah, as we're going to cover, this is not just a cautionary tale of, of just like being a, a positions of power. This is a really detailed portrait about how you can be seduced and unknowingly jaded by your position. That is such at the heart of this movie is the duality of they care. They really care. They're taking this school from down the ranks to number one in the nation. And you don't do that by turning a blind eye. This film goes out of its way to get you to empathize with these people on the jobs they are doing while slowly revealing to you just how twisted they can be underneath it all. And I think that's just a, a comment on how we get sucked into things. I think we've all been in a position where we realize we could get away with something and, and nobody would notice and maybe we did it. I think we've all been there. Yeah. This is really a, just a deconstruction of what is that feeling and how do you... Realize where you are. How do you sit, wake up to where you are? Yeah. So let's talk about who wrote this, because that's really where a lot of the talent lies, is this how is the, the story is constructed. It, yeah. uh, it's this guy, Mike Mikowski, who moved to the Roslyn School District as a first grader in 1997. <laughs> he said Frank Tassone, who is the superintendent that this is all about. The was Hugh the, Jackman character. He said he was the first person that he met. Really? Because Tassone would personally evaluate the reading level of every incoming student. That sounds exactly like what I saw him do in the, in the first act of this movie. Yeah, And that's crazy for a superintendent, not just the principal of the school you're going to, but the superintendent of the whole district, yeah. taking individualized attention because a new kid yeah. moved in. Yeah. Yeah. to town. So this guy, Mike Mikowski, was in seventh grade when the scandal broke in 2004, and then he went on to attend the high school. So he has personal experience living in this town, seeing the fallout of it, meeting the guy, knowing him just as anybody would in this community. Kind of similar to uh, Little Fires, um, in that she is also from that community yeah, as well. Yeah, from Shaker that, Heights. Yes. Yeah. Really interesting is, uh, is having these authors uh, actually give depictions of, of the world they came from. Yeah. It's really, really fascinating. So he went back because he moved to L.A. and then started screenwriting, went back mm. to check on it, mm. uh, thought the research would show, like we're saying, this greedy villain. But he was seeing this passion for education mm -hmm. that everybody's also talking about, although right. obviously people are hurt by what happened and the lies and betrayal and whatnot. He didn't speak with anybody involved, but he did interview teachers from the district, parents, and the editor-in-chief of the school, which right. is also a big part of this because... There is there a is, composite yeah. character played by Geraldine Viswanathan. Uh, her name is Rachel in the film, but she's a composite character of many real-life uh, students who worked at the school paper. And actually, this is where they broke it. This is where this started. Uh, and then New York Magazine picked it up and, and really broke it nationwide. But the actual students in Rosalind were the ones tracking this down and reporting it. And we'll get into when we get into the specifics exactly how much they did and didn't do because obviously it's Hollywoodized sure, yeah, to create yeah. drama. But Mike, who wrote this, mm -hmm. was the editor-in-chief five years later when he was a senior in high school. No way. So wow. he had the same position as the person who figured this out wow. in 2004. So he's very tied yeah, in man. to this story. But th that's the... the astounding thing is he's not against the school as well because he's the one that did it. He said, I had an incredible education there. Yeah. Quote, and then he said, and I think it's in large part strangely due to this man, Frank Tassone, who recruited most of the teachers I had. Yeah. Like this guy brought it up the rank. So he's yeah. like, I'm not mad at what I learned there. That's an interesting thing is like, okay, there's, you said earlier, there's lies and cheating and all that kind of stuff. 
not about being number one in the nation. You you don't do that by you know just scamming and then just going home and not doing your job. There's like, no billboard charts that you can <laughs> manipulate to be number one. You act the kids actually right. They have actually to. have to be number one. So I think that is the crazy part about this story is that these same people who pushed the school to where it got were simultaneously robbing it blind. Yeah, uh, it's, that is why this is is such an amazing story. So the story was rightly amazing in terms of the screenplay. It was on the blacklist for 2016. Wow. One of the most promising screenplays yes. that's not being made. So the agent of Mike sent it to this director, Corey Finley, who had just made this movie Thoroughbreds. Yes, yes. It was a big indie smash in, in 2017. I mean, I don't say indie. It's an indie smash. You probably didn't hear about it. But right. if you're into cinema at all, you probably did. A big feminist film at the time. And he actually comes as more of a playwright. He is actually, that's where his wheelhouse is, is stage. And what's crazy is his first day on set was his first day on set because he had been involved with theater. Wow. In New York. Oh, my gosh. So. Oh, my gosh. He's like <laughs> early 20s. Yeah. So it, when it premiered at Sundance in 2017, it was two weeks before his 28th birthday. Yeah. So two weeks before his 28th birthday. So he's about 30 now. And the screenwriter is roughly the same age. Mm -hmm. These people are barely pushing 30. <laughs> Yeah. This is a young group of filmmakers here that somehow have these A-listers on this story. I mean, that, that, I think that's just a testament to how good the story is, how good the screenplay really is. Yeah. Um, that somehow these guys who are at the very cusp of their career, look at what they have on their hands right now. So they send this screenplay to Hugh Jackman. Mm. for bad education he was iffy on it he was like i feel like it's three genres in one because mm -hmm. he's a professional he goes and like well let's see what this guy has done before this guy who's going to direct this mm -hmm. so he goes and watches thoroughbreds mm. 20 minutes in he's like i'm in i'm in <laughs> <laughs> i get it you know i see what this yeah, what yeah. this first movie yeah. first day on set of this kid <laughs> who so then after hugh jackman's in it these other actors are like well and i've always just, wanted yeah. to work with him yeah it just files in i'm sure uh, let's talk about what this is about, the story. Yeah. Just as understanding Roslyn Public Schools, in 2002, the Wall Street Journal called it the sixth best public high school in America. Mm. Like you said, they were on their way up. Mm -hmm. The school system budget, $78 million God. for the school system. Three wow. elementary, one middle, and one high school. So obviously the resources can be allocated. Mm -hmm. And this is on Long Island in New York. God, can you imagine being in charge of $78 million? <laughs> Right. So Frank Tassone, who is he? He was brought up in the Bronx. He got his bachelor's in Westchester and then two master's degrees, one in educational administration and languages and literature was wow. the other one. Mm. So keep that in mind. He also got his doctorate in educational administration at Teachers College in Columbia. Mm. And he wrote his dissertation on Charles Dickens, oh. which we'll get to at the very end. He worked as an administrator then in Westchester and Levittown before he landed in Roslyn in 1992. Oh. So he's been at it oh, wow. yeah. for a he'd while, been there for quite some at least time. a decade, Yeah, and has experience from the 70s when he graduated onward so it takes being a, in school systems. It takes oh, about a decade, a little bit over a decade for this to, to boil up. Yeah. yeah. A yeah. decade worth of uh, hand just in that school team, system, just in that school system, yeah. hand picking the team and and hit the fruits of his labor are really evident in seeing the school rise positions. The downside of the system, I saw a quote from this article I read: "Being the head of a wealthy school system is a little like being the head waiter at a fancy restaurant. You're at the top of your profession, but at the end of the day, you're still a waiter." <laughs> Gosh, and that's where a lot of the tension comes from. And he even said yeah. in, in interviews and whatnot, like, yeah. why why is this company, a tech company, where they're charged with $80 million making zillions, and I'm over here making 100000 I mean, $100,000 doesn't seem like it would be anything to complain about. But if it's like, well, if you're at the same level as right. somebody right. in a different field- They're making three times what I'm making? you know. Like but you're a teacher of... who's a public servant. Right. So that's where the conflict comes in. People say, you know, that we can't stress this enough- Amazing guy, met kids individually, right. created senior learning classes in conjunction with the high school, listened to people, yeah. you know, yeah. was in everybody's lives. Even, yeah. I thought this was great, started a book club. <laughs> he was the host of a book club every week. So That one, is where the movie starts. The first act is very much, you know, getting you inundated to the school and showing you how just wildly involved he is. Far more involved than any superintendent I have ever <laughs> heard of or seen. Me and Emily were going, wait, why he's these, I thought superintendents had like an office at the county. <laughs> 
you know, like he's out of school. Wait, yeah. he's like teaching classes almost. <laughs> like he yeah. is like one on one personal attention, knows their names, knows their issues. That's the important thing is yeah. he know he remembers everything about them. He remembers their story, and he 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 cares. He's invested yeah. actually in them and their story. Yeah, he cared about every one of those students. Yeah, so. Who was he? I right. mean, you know, that's what I, you, it's hard to put a thumb and, and on. And the this. big thing is how, like, how this lasted so long. Yeah. Not that, oh, you would never suspect, but it's like, well, what's he even doing wrong? Everything is going well. Right. Everything is going. And that's probably. Nothing is collapsing. It, back into the sense of, like, well, I can get away with this and nobody's watching and nobody will notice. And the other side of that coin is like, but I, and I'm doing a good job. <laughs> like, I'm doing a great job, you know? Yeah. And, and, and it's in there somehow you're able to justify. Somehow you're able to sweep it under the rug as yeah. if almost like it just didn't happen, doesn't exist. Yeah. Uh, obliv- playing dumb sheep oblivious to it. So, yeah. So how then did this long running scandal get unearthed? Yeah. And this is true to the real life as well as the movie. It was a clerk at a Home Depot store <laughs> of, of all people, the knight in shining armor. This clerk caught the son of Pam Glucken, Mm -hmm. who is the assistant superintendent. Played by Allison Janney. She won the Oscar last year for I, Tonya, maybe the year before. Oh, wow. She, the assistant superintendent, had given her son an unauthorized credit card. And this Home Depot person, it's crazy that that was the person who questioned. The first person after nearly a decade to question this because this guy, her son, who runs a contracting service was buying construction materials with the Rosalind School credit card. In in his personal car. Right. (laughs) And Rosalind School is 35 miles away from this Home Depot. And then they go to put the delivery address and it's being delivered to a site 50 miles away from Roslyn. Not the school. (laughs) And so he's like, well, maybe we should check on this. And this is one they found of 74 unauthorized credit cards that had been given out. So that's the other thing that's, you know, goes without saying is like people, it wasn't just the assistant and it wasn't just him. There were tons and tons of people benefiting from fudging the rules and giving money out. I mean, I bet on the backs of all of those decisions going like, well, we're number one in the, you know, like we're a great school system. Like everybody is great. Like Pam, Pam is great. Yeah. Frank is great. <laughs> Look, they're buying me and my son a place to, you know, like, yeah. like I, I bet on uh, that's a joke. But on the backs of it, I bet that success is part of the momentum here is like, well, yeah. it's, it's everything is going right. Except your, your, your ceiling is leaking, right. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Uh, so the fallout from this then. Frank is not implicated in it. It's just shown, oh, she's taken $250,000, much more than that. But that's what they can track with what she's been giving out. And so, (laughs) so so knowing it's much more than that, they come to her with $250,000 and she's going, oh, wow, that's, that's so much money, knowing full well, it's far more than that. Right. So he has her hushed up saying, and appealing to the school board because they have an attorney and the auditor like looking through all this and they're like, God, what are we going to do? And he's like, well, if this comes out, we're all in agreement that this is for the betterment of the school, the community. It's one of the best scenes of the film. Uh, You watch the school board having the right ideas, all the right things come to their minds. Well, we need to call the police. We need to make a public announcement. We need to have a press release. She has to be, you know, like all this kind of stuff. And then Frank turns to them and says, and starts talking about the impact, the property values in Rosalind sinking because of what this could do to the school. And then it's that kind of thing where you see all the board members give that a thought and go, uh, well, that's a a seemingly true thing and you start to see the alliance build there unbeknownst to even them that well okay maybe we can mitigate this yeah. maybe we can manage this in house and nobody really has to know and one of it, one it of the just yeah. something that stuck out to me is like this is this is how people get pulled along yeah this is something that people don't understand when they get pulled into something like that like you said in terms of them being good and doing the right thing the implications also of them having opulence was not even that evident to people at the time because Somebody who was a part of the school system at the time had said 
you know, he made $250,000, but that wasn't a questionable thing because of his position and what right. the money is going in into the school. He was also single. He told us he lived in a rent stabilized building. So when he showed up in a Brooks Brothers suit, we got, you know, right. that's what he's doing with his money. Right. And he has a $500 car allowance. You could lease a Mercedes for that. Like yeah. it all, nobody's really questioning, but they don't right. know all the other stuff he's doing yeah. outside of the school and where all this other money is going. For what example, they only see what they see. In the, in the list of charges, they mentioned dry cleaning. And I'm like, well, why is that? You know, it was great because I saw it was $33,000 <laughs> over the years that he had spent on dry cleaning. It's like, well, now that makes sense why that's a huge line item. Yeah. Because in all the lists, it was like, okay, tri <laughs> you know, trips and, and clothes and dry cleaning. I'm like, dry cleaning? Dry cleaning. <laughs> God. Oh, but he's spending 30 33 grand? <laughs> right. But the other thing is like they were writing checks and they had vague memo lines. So it could be a number of things. Or they oh put Wells God. Fargo because that was the investment firm, you know, for the school. But it's actually this other company. They also had all their friends. Friends who got free flights. You the know, fact so is, they don't know how much money was stolen. Right, even it's now they so have around estimates. eleven million, <laughs> but they just don't. They will never know, really. Right, I, and that is. I think you get that idea. Is like these people have no idea. They they do not know how much money they have taken. They mm -hmm. don't. It's because the system that is around this, the system that incentivized them to to take where they could and get away with it where they could. It just started f flying by them, and they're totally blind to it. They just started doing it, and they're, I don't think they're keeping tally of it all. Yeah. And so by the time it actually is crashing down on their heads, they're being told numbers that almost sound astronomical even to them. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the things, the, the leaky roof was fixed, but then, like, the contractor got hired in some line items several more times. <laughs> where did that money yeah, go? Did it go to yeah. him? Did somebody else? Who knows where it went? Oh my God. <laughs> so the big break for this, like we said, 2004, two years later, and this I don't think is in the movie oh. for creative reasons, but there was a letter that was an anonymous right, yes. letter that had citations, specific allegations implicating Frank Tasson in what had happened two years ago with the assistant superintendent. What? that had been distributed to various members of the school board okay. and the community. I think I understand why they've omitted this. In the timeline the film presents, this happens much sooner. Right. Uh, they don't take a two-year time break to go and something's happening. Uh, they The film truncates this just a bit. It feels like it may, a couple months have gone yeah. by and wait, no, we haven't fixed the problem. We're still missing money wildly. It's also wild, too, because the author of this letter has never come out or been identified really? as, the, as the person. Oh, man. So where the... Where the kid from the high school fits in is because Frank, interestingly, got one of these letters. I don't think he was supposed to, but it got sent out to the huh. members of the school. So he got one. And so then he knew that everybody was learning about it. So he had uh -huh. called this meeting saying, hey, there's this letter. This is not true. It's implicating Pam. And the girl from the school was like, I didn't even know the assistant superintendent was removed from this. I don't think people in the community knew about Understood, what Pam yeah. had done two yeah. years ago because it was kind of hushed and it was like, oh, she had resigned and she rug, was given the money back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that kind of thing. So she then said to her journalism teacher, and I think in the movie it's literally the superintendent, Frank, who she yeah. goes to, but it's her journalism teacher who's like, if it's the truth, you got to publish it. Maybe, you know, it'll be interesting for people to know that this letter had come out and that Frank is implicated in what had happened two years ago. Yeah. So it goes, she said, nobody cares about it. The April Fool's issue in terms of the school was way more popular <laughs> than this one. But the local news station got wise to it, then started oh. looking into it. The lawyer and the Realizing auditor- were not out of this. The lawyer and the auditor happening. are like, hey, we, uh, we didn't do this right. He picked us to do this. Then you see all these. Now oh. the whole thing is unraveling. Buckle so, up. This is <laughs> <laughs> one of the thing that one of the things that unravels, which becomes a big part of the the story, is he had used some of his embezzled funds to buy a three hundred thousand dollar house with somebody in Nevada with a partner. In, in Again, Las he's Vegas. supposed to be in a rent controlled apartment, right. single. <laughs> <laughs> so that's something that comes up. And one of the things that Frank wanted to make clear is in the movie they make it a former student and. That was never the case. This was somebody who lived in Las Vegas, okay. who was an exotic male dancer mm -hmm. that he had gone on trips see. to see. So the way they present that in, in the film is another way that they try to get you to empathize with Frank. And it starts with accidentally running into each other, and Frank just remembers everything about this guy and what was going on in his like middle school life. Right. 
And so it, it immediately uh, Frank is able to just like ask the right questions. Like, well, how was your mom? You know, like all those types of things, like following up on the issues that this kid had. So you get the idea. Oh, my God, this is where you get the idea. He remembers everybody. He yeah. really does remember everybody. They end up starting a relationship just because right. he's so d- dumbfounded that this guy, my sole superintendent, even <laughs> remembers my name, let alone yeah. what, what my troubles were in math class, you know? Yeah. The other then piece of this is he also, his, his partner... Frank has a real life partner. There was partner another partner. Who lives in <laughs> Manhattan. The way they present that in the film is, is incredible is uh, the Rachel character from the uh, school newspaper. She follows down uh, one of the addresses, one of the vendors, for some crazy expense. And she ends up in some apartment complex. Uh, and she starts to get weirded out, about to knock on the door that is the address. But this is an apartment complex. I'm supposed to be looking for like a textile place. Yeah. This is clearly a residence. So she kind of chickens out, walks down the hall, and then you see Frank walk up to the door. Mm. And you you start to understand right then. He goes in, you see there's a partner in there, and they see each other. She just bolts out the door. Right. All of that is fabricated. The high, Like I said, the high schooler did not go to Manhattan yeah. <laughs> to uncover this conspiracy. And that was the other thing that Frank was not into in regards to the film is he's like, Stephen was my partner. We had been together for decades. Mm-hmm. Like he knew that we were in an open relationship and I was seeing this other guy okay. in Las Vegas. The so it wasn't plays even... it a bit more sequestered about like, he doesn't know about this and, and there's infidelity and yeah. right. No, yeah. he was like, that was not true at all. They and that was Hollywood the walls drama. that Frank has with who, uh, you know, he's this guy to these people. He's this guy to these people. He's this guy to these people. Right. They play and that up and it sounds like it wasn't part quite of it. Yeah, that Cause way. part of it is the whole point is, Oh, he's, a, he's a widowed man right, who had right. this that wife <laughs> fr- who you know who died a long time ago at an early age and never got remarried. And he's saying, no, that did happen, but I love Joanne. Right. And then I had this relationship with Stephen, but I was prejudiced against in the 70s and was removed from a job because I was gay. And mm. that's why I didn't want that to be a part mm-hmm. of. And he's like, I don't know why they're bringing it up now in this movie if it's 2020, mm-hmm. why that became an issue. But he's like, the, the the way that they make it seem like I'm neglecting my wife, he like started tearing up in the interview because he's Aww. like, that's not, yeah. that's part of it is not yeah. true. I loved my wife. I love Steven. Like, there's not, I there's not that. They, they kind of play it for comedy in, in one way because he, you know, to the, all the parents and everything at the school, the deceased wife is a very real thing and they're kind of touchy, but yeah. like, he is still getting like hit on by some like moms and stuff like that. Right. And, and he so was like, that never, around it. Yeah. He was like in the interview that right. really offended him because he was like, that never happened. I never was talking to even a former student in the case of the Nevada yeah. thing yeah. or. That parents. actually makes yeah. me good. And I'm glad to know that. That is, you know, that some of the little, the salacious tinges that are tacked on there aren't exact. They were tacked on there. Is they're a little bit to enhance the drama. Yeah, uh, it's good to know. It's like okay, he didn't start a relationship with the next student. It's like <laughs> yeah. okay, his maybe he he did have a partner that he lied to everybody about, but that partner did know that it was a kind of an open relationship. And so and it was they, because you know, he got you know guff for it years and years before. So what happened was he was sentenced in 2006. Mm. He did a little under four years, got out for good behavior and completing the rehabilitation. He was on probation until two years ago. Mm. He can be in no jobs where he's responsible for money. Mm. And he repaid all that he stole because he was still getting pensions from being the superintendent. Right. So he's able to replace a little over $2 million that was credited specifically to him. Pam was sentenced She was released in 2011 and then was on parole. She passed away in 2017. And she really, really went under the radar. Like people didn't even, she was living somewhere in New York going about her days. I'll post a link to it, of course. There's an interview that Frank did and he hasn't spoken, obviously, because he was in jail and then afterwards, but like since this happened. Right. He hasn't really had a reason to speak about it publicly and maybe until now. And so it's a bit touching to see that he's able to talk about this because it is like, hey, I was this, I loved this institution, I devoted my whole life to it, I did a bad thing, it caught up to me, I paid the price, and he's just seeking absolution and forgiveness. Reminded me a lot of like, Catch Me If You Can, Frank Abagnale, and the Steven Spielberg film where he, like that guy also wrote a book about his life, was like, I forged checks, I was stupid, I'm sorry, and then he works for the FBI, and now that's like, his calling is like, I don't want people to do what I did because of the pain that I caused and the pain for myself. I also thought it was cool. He was saying in terms of his prison sentence, he went to three different prisons. The second one he was in, he taught at, like they have a little education rehabilitation thing. He taught there Mm -hmm. and he also took courses in criminal behavior to learn why he did 
what he did. Oh, fascinating. And then his third prison was the work release prison, and he ran the whole educational arm oh my God. of that prison. <laughs> taught, well, let te- Frank run it. Yeah, <laughs> teaching these, well, teaching these inmates how to go, because he's like, some of these people had never even written a check. They don't know when they, you know, if they've been in prison for this long, how to get back out in the world and work and all that stuff. Oh my so God, he, I could watch a whole movie of, of, of <laughs> Hugh Jackman doing that. <laughs> a sequel Afterwards. to this, just in prison, teaching yeah. all these felons. But like, it's inspiring <laughs> to hear this guy because obviously stand and deliver and yeah <laughs> yeah this movie has aggrieved him so much now it's come back to haunt him almost 20 years later and yeah. he's like but i i did i learned i did i'm trying yeah. you know even in the course of him paying his punishment he's still trying to give back yeah in a way that he knows how and he yeah. said there were things that were true and good probably 40 to 50 percent of the film is accurate the fact that i was sitting on beanbags with kids and with parents <laughs> You know, like we said, the marriage stuff, not true. Like the stuff with his relationships, yeah. he was really like, that really hurt me. Mm-hmm. The way It was a bit portrayed a bit more salacious than in truth. Right. Still right. shocking if you're like in that community and right. think he's just this widower. It's like, oh, he is, he's homosexual. He has two lovers. I bet the what you take away from the film is more what the uh, community, the direct community felt more than was actually accurate. Right. And he's still in a relationship with Steven. They've been together for over 45 years. Well, there you years. go. There you go. You know. And of course, as for Jackman's performance, he praised it heavily. He said a vi- he did a very good job, quote, especially at the end when I walk out of prison mm-hmm. and I see what I lost. Yeah. He said, that's really what hit home for me because I did lose all of that because of greed and because I broke the law. Yeah. He, he also said in terms of things that he liked, he said, Alice and Janney. Spot on. That's exactly how <laughs> Pam was in her attitude, in her cadence. If you aren't her- aware of Alice and Janney, this movie has a ton of reason to watch it. Alice and Janney's performance is incredible, and uh, this is just a, a perfect, perfect role for her. Mm-hmm. I don't think we've talked enough about her today. Yeah. And just I, I haven't spoken enough about the comedy of this mm-hmm. film. Much of this film lives in the contrast of the, the wildness of what's going on underneath the rug and then who these people are, actually are. I mean, they yeah. really are these educators. And Alice and Janney is in no small part of that. Uh, she brings in an incredible energy mm-hmm. to this I, I I just I just wanted to harp on her for yeah, a second. I love her. For sure. When people were talking about Frank that had been a part of this in the community, mm. who they referenced that tie into this movie, one of them that they say that Frank is like, they called him Dr. Pecksniff, which I didn't know who this character was mm. at all, who Mm-mm. they're relating it Mm-mm. to. This is the villain in a novel called The Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit. And this is a book by Charles Dickens. Very oh. small part in the film, it is the book that he is reading in some scene. Oh, oh, and I see. It might even be for the book club. Yes. Um, yeah. So what's crazy about this is, if you remember, we had said that he got his doctorate and his thesis was on Charles Dickens. Right. So that's why they put him in the movie. The irony is that the story is the, this guy, Martin Chuzzlewit, who's introduced to this character, Pecksniff, who they're saying Frank is, yeah. who is a widower, who is a self-styled teacher of architecture. Oh, no. So he came about it. He believes that he's a great moral guy, um, but he mistreats his students and makes their designs into his own for profit. Mm. That's, his, that's his thing. So that was the illusion mm. that they were making. The, the story of Charles Dickens is that he had visited the U.S. in 42, before he had made the pre-Civil War. And... In the book about Chuzzlewit, that character gets sent to the U.S., and this book becomes a satire on the U.S., how it's this near wilderness, and there's only pockets of civilization, and there's deceitful, you know, shucksters, and that's what the U.S. is. I found a clipping from the Baltimore Sun newspaper from 1843, the next year after this came out, and I'll just quote it directly because it seemed crazy, and I don't know if it's true or not, but they said... Uh, An Englishman named Jacob Bull, who took a passage aboard the Eliza for New York, accidentally met on board the ship with a copy of Martin Chuzzlewit, and in the course of his reading became so disgusted with New York that to avoid the necessity of entering it, he drowned himself. (gasps) This book gave America and the people of America such a bad reputation for the people of England at this time, which I, I was just crazy that it's like, that's also what he got his thesis on, Yeah, was Charles Dickens. So- do you think that somehow, with his study on this, that it just like crept into his subconscious? <laughs> I don't know. Like, I think I think it's I think it's interesting how also with like Frank and understanding his story and now moving mm-hmm. past it, there's an also also an element of that to this story. So 
Charles Dickens got super famous, like I said, from Great Expectations, right. Tales, all that stuff, came back 25 years later okay. in 1868. Bearing in mind this is after the Civil War. This is the, 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 the next time he goes to the U.S. Okay. Because he's famous, he realizes also that America has matured and changed from that. Mm. He gave, I mean, this maybe also helped because he gave 76 public readings in the time that he was in the U.S. for that year. 5,000 people stood in line and 40,000 attended his performance in New York wow. of a reading of his book. So oh my gosh. there was a banquet in his honor, Charles Dickens' honor for that year, and he acknowledged the positive transformation his take on America was yeah. wrong. And that speech, he said, would always be in the preface to Martin Chuzzlewit from then on as it's published. And that stands, it is in the oh, book, wow. his change in stance. And I think that that really is an interesting interwoven layer of like what the, a system does, how somebody has done something wrong, how they might change. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, the passing of time, the maturity of yeah. all these things, both you and the system. Uh, and can, can things be changed? Well, I <laughs> guess they can. Yeah. Uh, that, that, a reputation of the, somebody being that, forgiven. And that's what uh, I'll post, like I said, I'll post a link to the interview of that Frank did in a podcast just a few days ago. Yeah, just this um, week. <laughs> just this week. And he's like, yeah, I want to figure out ways that I can teach people the lessons that I've learned. Yeah. And not be yeah. Very much judged like for that Gavin, and learn yeah. how to move on and give yeah. to people. You know, that's beautiful. I mean, you, so, I mean, that's so rare. <laughs> to be honest, I'm so glad that you mentioned Frank Abagnale because that's his whole life now is you know waging uh, against the what he did, yeah, uh, and and giving back and helping explain to people how these things can happen, how you can get caught up in something, yeah, and it can snowball. The momentum builds bigger than you can ever imagine. So hopefully, this movie, and in, in, instead of it being a negative lens on this guy, it will be a positive lens where he can say, oh, cool, now people know who I am. I can start speaking to audiences about he, what this was. He has a, uh, Frank has a, a great scene in the movie where he really just comes clean and he speaks about how it starts and, and just out at lunch and realizing they accidentally put the, the meal on the, comp on the school card. Right. And you go, well, nobody noticed. I mean... Maybe I'll, you know, maybe I'll do it again next week. Maybe I'll do it again tomorrow. You know, like well, nobody noticed. It's, yeah. It, it was a beautiful acknowledgement of of the moment the yeah. course went wrong, and it's such a rare, uh, vulnerable moment. You know, I feel like in real life we're we're kind of lacking where that the real clarity and moments. So it's it's. A, that's almost what cinema is for, is to actually get to that moment, get to the acceptance where he's actually saying out loud and admitting to people, yes, I did this. Yeah. And it's bigger than I could have ever imagined. Yeah. And I never wanted to end up where I am right now. And if I could change it, I absolutely would. The problem is <laughs> it's happened already yeah. and I don't know what I'm in the middle of. In that scene, you get the weight of it all and you understand how you get swept up. I think Maybe obviously not all of he's, it, he's ready like we said, he went to prison. He paid it all yeah. back. Yeah. He's been living his life for the past 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe now is an opportunity to be like, hey, I, I can finally... Because that's what he is. He's an educator. That's what he devoted his whole life to. Yeah. I mean, he, he is. He absolutely is. He is an educator. And that's the amazing thing about this thing is that he legitimately is a good educator. The opposite of the title. I know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's as if the bad education is talking about the system and the and the hierarchy of power and how what that teaches you, as I suppose. You know, it's because yeah. they gave a great education. <laughs> yeah. Again, you can't fake number one in the nation. You, that's not part of the scandal here. Yeah. Uh, and this... This I thought was absolutely worth bringing to you guys and, and getting behind because I, yeah. I don't I, I, there's tons of videos out there I'm sure what's true what's not but I, I I don't think anybody's quite done the research that you have done that we brought today this is just an incredible story where you, it's hard to understand how yes he's the, a legitimate number one in the nation an incredible educator also stole millions of dollars <laughs> right for and outright other robbed people. yeah. yeah. <laughs> And how can that be? How can that exist in the same consciousness? Yeah. It's absolutely worth getting into. So I had a blast Very cool. with this. Yeah. So we are going back into Harry Potter next week. And we're getting into the cinema of it. So hit us up on our on our Instagram page, at AlliteratePod. Tell us what you thought of this episode. Uh, tell us if you watched the movie, what you thought of it. I thought it was a blast. One of my favorites of the year. I'm telling you, look out for this in nominations acting-wise later, uh, later in the season. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed it. 
Uh, we will catch you next week. Yeah.